Um, Mary, uh, thank you for uh, agreeing to come and talk today. Uh, you, you have a very significant track record in academia, leadership in universities and academia overall more than two decades. And your recent involvement was with San Jose University. You've been a president. Um, and now you are with ASOF and you are uh, in a board of ASOF and you are a, a leadership, a driving force behind that organization. So comparing to your previous engagements with uh, all of the Armenian causes as well, you've been in many, many Armenian movements and causes uh, before, is ASOF special? And if, it, if, if so, what, uh, how do you see um, the mission of ASOF in, uh, f from your perspective? What is your personal take on that? Thank you, Aram. It's great to be here with you as well. And, and I do think ASOF is special. I have uh, found all of my engagements to be very rewarding. And uh, some have been more successful than others, to be honest. But I think ASOF has come together in a different way at a particular time with a different purpose. And, and I think that's why it's so critical today. It, it really emerged after the 44-day uh, war when there was a sense of urgency of survival um, in the Armenian global nation. And uh, the recognition that we have many uh, experts in, in academia, but in all of the disciplines, all of the areas of state building, of economics, of engineering and science, of humanities and the arts, uh, around, around the world, uh, as well as within the country, because there's tremendous talent here as well in Armenia. And how can we bring everybody together to begin to think about building capacity uh, with the guiding principles of excellence, of networking, of using our collective power to make a difference. And I think what makes ASOF special is that it really, it doesn't have an ego in the same way. It's not worried about if something is ASOF's or not. It doesn't own anything. It is about people coming together to share their expertise their commitment to Armenia, to ensuring that Armenia becomes a strong, forward-looking, uh, continually um, evolving and dynamic nation, um, and survives uh, to be a leader in, in the world. And so I, um, I find it to be compelling. What has been very rewarding is to see how people have come together. And again, we, you know, our philosophy is we don't need to create something new. If it's already here, or if it's another, another organization is doing it, We'll collaborate with them, we'll partner with them, we'll support them. Uh, but if we can bring different organizations together with, with new voices to find a new path forward, then we all benefit. Great, thank you. Um, the first gathering of ASOF was uh, about one year ago in the nice lagoon of Venice in the Mkhitaryan Monastery. And um, at that time, it was the first one, it was very new. Uh, this was this ex excitement of new, but again, we were one year closer to our uh, war and disastrous war, and the pain and wounds were uh, even more um, strong than probably now. Uh, but uh, what has changed uh, since then? Because there was, everything was new then, everybody was excited, but it was the first step. Now, one year later, how far we went towards, as ASOP, we went towards our mission? Well, I, was, I, I first was very pleased at how quickly and, and um, uh, how engaged people were a year ago in Venice. And Venice was chosen for a particular reason, because that's the place the first Armenian book was published. So it really is a center, a uh, historical center of Armenian learning. And, and ASOF is really about bringing the expertise of science and, and academic perspectives you know, to bear on the questions at hand and on the solutions. What I think has happened is we've continued to grow. The, um, you know, every day, every, every week, every month, we have new uh, fellows who join uh, the, if you will, it's a movement, I think, that embraces all of us. And we've begun to see as the task forces, which are working in any number of areas, and, and the topics are generated by the fellows themselves. 
Um, some of them have actually moved forward in some very good ways where they're uh, ready to look at the funding, to look at the actual details around implementation, where they've moved between just idea phase. And others are newer. They're new ideas where people are really having the initial conversations to see what direction is most needed. And I want to stress, these are conversations that are being had between compatriots both outside Armenia and within Armenia. It is really a, a joint conversation. And I think what we've been most um, uh, energized by is, is the widespread engagement in the questions at hand and the people willing to think about how they can use what they know, the networks they have, to, uh, again, strengthen Armenia and opportunity here. Thank you. Uh, we see this time as an uh, existential th threat to Armenia. It's not only because of the immediate uh, problem with our borders. Um, many perceive it like that, but that's not the only problem. Um, the future is very unclear. That, that's another problem, but that's for the whole world. But also there is this uh, understanding that without being a leader in development and a leader in science and technology and the human capital, Armenia stands no chance. That's the more existential problem, should I say, because even if we solve the immediate problems, this one will stay. So, and many in ASOF now say that without diaspora, that's not possible to achieve. Uh, we've had way too much loss of human capital in Armenia, too much loss in science, education, everywhere along the board. Uh, across the board, and it's, it's, it's gonna be hard. And this is probably the first time in the history of the modern Armenia when the diaspora started to make so much sense, an existential sense to Armenia. Well, how do you perceive that from the side of diaspora and how the wider diaspora outside of ASOF uh, perceives this moment, especially because I know you are involved very much in diaspora. It's not only ASOF that you are involved in. Yeah, my family, of course, has been um, part of the diaspora for over 100 years. So this is uh, my, my mother's uh, family, her father's family, first left their towns in uh, Western Armenia in the 1880s, late 1880s, 1890s. So I've been a diasporan for 125, 30 years, um, at least my family has. It's, uh, it's um, an interesting time. What I've noticed, certainly in my lifetime, there are two moments where the diaspora has really come alive in a different way uh, from just thinking about how do we make sure our own diasporan communities are strong. Because the diasporan communities are also at risk. Um, Armenia's at risk, but the communities in the diaspora are equally at risk, but for different reasons. And the last time this happened was after the earthquake in 1988. Again, another existential crisis, another tragedy where so much loss of life. I, I remember when I woke up that day and saw that news and I said, we haven't lost as many Armenians in a single day since the genocide, which was true. And, and so we're in another one of those moments. Um, we're, it, it's playing out differently. There's a broader context of uncertainty that is around us. I think there's no question in my mind anyway that um, the diaspora is strengthened by a strong Armenia. That over time, the diaspora can't survive without a, a homeland. It needs an anchor, and Armenia is that anchor. Um, the, the first time I came to Armenia, it was the first time, and that was early, 1974. I made a very early trip with my family. It was the first time I was surrounded by everyone speaking Armenian, for example. It's a very different experience when you're not from here. Uh, and, and, but I also believe that Armenia cannot thrive, as you said and indicated, without engagement by the diaspora. And why? Because first of all, the world is global. Yes, globalization right now is under some threat post-COVID and all of that, we know that. But it still is a very uh, tightly connected world. And that is true in the Armenian world as well. And so we need to take advantage of that. And I'm seeing not just the brain drain that we saw in the 90s where talent just left, but I'm also seeing people coming back 
Or I'm seeing people leave but also come back, They're living part of their life in where I am from, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, for example, thinking about the tech industry, and part of their life here in, in Armenia. So it's a different rhythm. And I think as we understand that the diaspora communities have their own particular challenges, Armenia has its challenges, but there's a greater uh, overlap in terms of what we can do to support each other. Uh, then I think there's a future it's possible. And, and I'm actually very optimistic about it while recognizing that, yes, we need to be pragmatic in addressing the urgent um, challenges, which some of which we can control the outcomes and some of which we can't. But what, what we can control is our readiness, the work we do to build the strongest Armenia possible. And as we build a strong Armenia, we are also building a strong diaspora because now people can see a purpose and a connection. Uh, having um, a large experience in leading education, higher education in, in, uh, in America, how do you see uh, the chances of uh, universities in Armenia to succeed and potentially become world-class uh, educational institutions? And what are the major steps towards that? What are the, probably the major points they have to address to become much better? Well, let's talk, um, world class is a hard thing to measure. There are many rankings. I don't know what that means exactly. Um, but I can tell you what we need to do to continually improve. Let's set the goal of improving constantly and addressing world standards, which is a different way of thinking about it. And then I think we'll start to see uh, a positive movement. I, I, Armenia has the, um, the, the human capital to do well. The problem with us is that we don't have the institutional systems to, to be successful. And so we have to really look at the challenges systemically. But it starts with, with there's a number of factors uh, that are involved, and many of them are, are, are obvious. Um, some of them are complicated. Some of them are, are you know, historic. We inherit uh, uh, ways of thinking that uh, don't necessarily serve us well going forward. But it starts first with a commitment to excellence. We, we have to understand what that means. And we have to come with a common understanding and say that everything we do is going to be at a level that would be acceptable anywhere in the world. Let's start there. We have to have a commitment to integrity, which means um, that the work we do is, is honest, right? This means good research based on the right principles, um, no plagiarism, right? That collaboration, yes, plagiarism, no. No, so, no bias, no uh, politics. It, no politics, that just good work. And this is where I think ASOF can help because um, the academics in all fields, Armenians uh, around the world are working at very high levels. They know how to do it. And so it's a matter of partnering with our colleagues here in, in Armenia who have the capability of doing it as well. And it's just a matter of seeing what that looks like and having the support. Some of it is funding. Some of it is, um, first, we need to pay people. We need to pay our faculty. We need to pay our teachers a living wage so that they are able to dedicate their time to the excellence of their work. And, and, and then we need to look at our curriculum. How, in fact, are we educating? The curriculum is changing all over the world. We're facing this in the United States, too. We've had to go from what we call um, imparting knowledge, right, the, the expert um, who then uh, you know, shares that with the student, to now, because you can find information everywhere, right? We all have our smartphones. We know how to Google. We find information. There's also ChatGPT now. ChatGPT, which has got its limitations. <laughs> right. But it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting tool that we have if we learn to use it correctly, I think. And, um, and so how do we then create the, uh, the problem solving mindset, the critical thinking mindset, which is going to really uh, characterize those who lead in, in, um, in the 21st century knowledge economy, because that's what we're educating for. And that's where we have an opportunity to, um, I think, to, to leapfrog. We don't have to learn everything. We need to think about, because there's so much change in the world, where do we, what do we have to do to get to where we need to go? And let's leapfrog there. And, and the last thing I would say here is that we need to have a respect for experts, which we don't have. Let's be honest with ourselves. We, we pretend to, and then the politics, and it's thank you, thank you, and then we're gonna do what we want. No, we have experts, and so if we can set up some independence, 
some autonomy where experts can provide their input. And that's what ASOP is looking to do. Uh, and then let's engage with those experts in a meaningful way. Uh, and, and that means um, being a little bit humble too, which is also not one of our strengths. Right. So uh, summarizing uh, what you just said, we, we believe that ASO will succeed. It has to dismiss itself in 20 years, which means we have to. We have little time to succeed, little in the scope of what we want to do. And, and I, I, I totally agree with you that we, we need some humbleness. We need uh, to understand that excellence is important and work towards the excellence uh, in all of the areas, science, education, etc. And, and, and judging from yesterday's meetings, there were, there were so many exciting things happening uh, in Armenia and outside of Armenia that are coming to support this vision of a successful future in, in Armenia in terms of science, education, human capital, and everything we want Armenia to become. Thank you. Thank you so much.